Now, Dublin's Little Jerusalem, a history of Dublin's Jewish quarter. Uh, what we're going to try and do in about 50 minutes together, I know it's going to be a tall order for a historian to pack anything into 50 minutes. We usually do books of about 600 pages, all of them very dry and boring, uh, which we like because, you know, why wouldn't we? Um, but, but we'll tell you a bit more about myself. So my family arrived in what was then the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. It is obviously not that anymore. Ireland is independent. But back in the day, in the 1880s, my family arrived in the UK, which included Ireland back then. And they were known as the Wardaks, and it came from a place called Donyats near Bialystok in modern day Poland, though then it was the Russian Empire. Uh, they changed their name simply because it probably, they wanted to be less noticeable. So for a while it was Vardich, and then it became Vard, V-A-R-D as it is today. Um, there's a number of people you can, if you Google the name, it'll pop up. There's a few people in Ireland with the name that, uh, some of them famous, some of them not so much, some of them infamous. Um, but we don't know exactly when it happened, but they developed uh, and became furriers. We think in London, uh, because they came over here and pretty quickly opened up their own furrier business from about 1916. Uh, the reason why they came here, without going too much into it, is because they didn't want to be drafted into the First World War, which was a big thing at the time. A lot of young men, doesn't matter what your religion was, being shafted off to um, the Somme. And my uh, great-great-grandfather, you can see in the bottom left there, uh, that's a very old photo of the Edwardian period or even Victorian period photo of my great-great-grandfather, man who brought the family from Poland, uh, Israel Moses Vardich, or Wardak as he would have originally been. He w didn't want, um, basically didn't want his sons to be killed in the Western Front fighting in someone else's war, which everybody can understand. And so they moved them to Ireland, which was the one place where they were definitely not going to be conscripted. And so they arrived here and have been here ever since. Um, yeah, the, the, the Vard family, to just give you a sense of how successful they were at one point, my grandfather, you can see him on the extreme left of the middle bottom photo. Uh, that's him with his brothers and his sister in the 1980s. Uh, he alone, just him, Julian Vard, you can see his, one of his, um, the labels of one of his uh, coats there up on the upper right. He, he alone just had six shops. Uh, and he was considered one of the less successful of the many brothers and sisters and cousins who populated the Vard family once upon a time. Uh, unfortunately, as we all know, uh, a time came when people didn't want to buy as much furs. And in general, there was, it was cheaper to buy cheap leathers or cheap uh, sheepskins, etc. And uh, by the 80s, it was pretty much on the downward swing. And many of the, as you can see there, they're not in, their, in the youngest of ages by that point. And so sadly today, there may be just the one company left that bears the name Varg, that's a furrier, uh, which is sad, but you know, these things happen. Um, as for myself, uh, I, there was never really something that was going to happen to me. My family, my father had already uh, uh, moved his, um, his career into an academic field. So it was never really something that my, I was going to end up doing. And being as my mother is very academic as well, it was just, that was the direction I was always going. Uh, as I said before, uh, I started the company to try and explore that part of Dublin, and these days I still do it a bit, but uh, we're all still recovering from the pandemic period. Um, these days, the community in Ireland is rather small, but then again, it has never really been very big. Uh, to give you a comparison, the population in England is about 200,000, maybe just over 200,000 today. In Ireland, maybe two and a half thousand. Now again, we're a much, much smaller island and a much smaller population overall anyway, but it's, it's about half what it once was. Uh, about, about the 1930s, it reached its max of about five and a half thousand. Um, that and at the same time would have had about nine synagogues in Dublin, two in Cork, which is a town in the south of Ireland, two in Limerick, another town in the south of Ireland, and three in Belfast, which is in the north of Ireland. Uh, today, there is actually only one resident rabbi in the Republic, this part of Ireland, Rabbi Zaman Yetlent who is um, the Chabad rabbi in the Orthodox synagogue. Uh, there is also a, a rabbi who comes from Manchester infrequently for the reform synagogue, but often members of the congregation perform services themselves. Uh, yeah, and today, uh, if, the, if there is a center, culturally speaking, if it's not the Orthodox synagogue uh, and the area around it, which a lot of Orthodox Jews live in, it would be the Irish Jewish Museum, which is kind of a cultural center opened by the Irish-born president of Israel, Chaim Herzog, in 1985.
but we'll get to that later on. Uh, basically, there's been a community here for on and off for 900 years, and we hope there is one in another 900, but that will have to wait for the people <laughs> who come after me and come after others. So, shall we start our little history? Uh, where does it all begin? Uh, at the beginning, of course. Uh, and the beginnings of our community, uh, as far as we were aware, um, is in 1171, a very fateful year, when the man you can see there to the right in painting of uh, Henry II, a French king of England, funny enough, um, he uh, invaded Ireland, 1171, and quite soon afterwards, we have evidence of the very first small Jewish community. Uh, there is even some evidence there may have been amongst the many um, subscribers to this particular invasion, 1171, there was about 2,000, one who gave about 60, I think, gold doubloons or whatever they were using as currency at the time was actually a man from Gloucester, Josh. I was described as being Jewish. So there is an origin kind of story to the community. Uh, by about the 1240s, we have evidence of about, about 80 individuals, probably a fairly small group that came from Gloucester. Um, other than that, we don't know much about them. This is just the origins of the community. We don't know much about them because they weren't wealthy. And simply put, if you weren't wealthy, you just, just did not show up in histories from that time. And even a lot of wealthy people don't show up in histories from that time. So that's about the extent of our original knowledge. Uh, we know Dublin would have looked much like the artistic rendering you can see there on the bottom. My guess is being is they were probably attached to the export and import trade. And as, at, uh, as it was at the time, this is one of the re reasons you have the kind of the idea of the money lender from medieval Europe was that Christians were seen as not being able to uh, give um, what was known as usury, basically lending money. So I would imagine they were working in the export import trade, probably connected in some way to uh, the lending of money. But that was medieval Europe, you know, but we'll fast forward to a bit more about what we know. So. That's medieval history, bits and pieces survive from that. But the stuff, the consistent, me, consistent linear history that we know quite a lot about uh, in regards to our community did not begin until much later on, until about 1660. The reason being is that from 1291, uh, all Jews were expelled from the lands, the possessions of the English crown, and that included conquered Ireland. And so whatever happened to that original community, as I said, we don't know. Uh, they may have stayed, they may have left. Uh, a few were certainly here because there's mayors of Cork, for example, like William, William Moses Anias, who was a Savardim living in the southern part of Ireland. He's a bit of a mystery. We don't know much about him or his son, who was also mayor after him. Uh, but we do know that a rather noted villain, unpleasant individual known as Oliver Cromwell, who most Irish people uh, will spit at the merest spit on the ground at the merest naming, uh, naming of, uh, was responsible, rather ironically, for the arrival of our community. Uh, you can see a painting of him on the bottom left there. Rather famously, that painting was drawn um, and uh, the painter tried to remove his warts. He was a very warty man on his face. And, uh, the, he, and Cromwell said, no, no, paint me warts and all. Um, which unfortunately he's not been paid to warts and all in England, but over here in Ireland, there's quite a lot of hatred for him because his conquest and violence in Ireland killed about 40% of the population, pretty grim. Uh, but he was also economically minded. He wasn't merely a religious extremist. He was, he was definitely that. He was also a man who thought about the economy in Ireland and what he wanted to do. And he read uh, a document, which you can see there, the Commonwealth of Oceania, by a man called James Harrington. And Harrington said, you know, there's just, we have a long history of planting Scots, English, Flemish, Germans in Ireland, and it didn't work very well. So maybe we should plant um, 10,000 North African uh, kind of Jews. And these will create businesses and they'll create um, infrastructure, etc. They'd help Ireland better than hundreds of thousands of more of the same English and German settlers, you know? And so this is, gives an idea in um, Cromwell's mind. And in 1657, the ban that had been in place for 400 odd years was finally revoked. A community sets up in London and quite, and this is where you get the Bevis Mark synagogue, which is still there today in London. Um, but our community originates on that tiny wet street that you can see there. That's called Crane Lane in Dublin. And that was where the very, very first synagogue that we know of is built in Ireland. Uh, and that's Sephardim arriving from London, basically, to 
carry on the, the, the kind of the re-emergence in, in, in Britain and Ireland. So this is the beginnings in it with a Sephardim community, but we'll move on. Um, now at the time, the kings of England were Germans. Uh, they were known as the Hanoverians. Uh, you might be familiar with one of them, but most of you are American, I imagine. So you have your George the first, second, and third. Obviously, I, I well, maybe not obviously. I hope you know who George the third is. We'd be in a lot of trouble if you don't know who George the third is. Uh, but they're all Germans. And quite a lot of German Jews, because of that connection with Germany, arrive into Ireland in the early 18th century. And really, they make up most of the, uh, the population by about 1720s, so mid 18th century. Um, they were known as the English Jews because they actually uh, integrated very, very well, which again is not particularly surprising to anyone who knows their history. The Jewish populations, no matter where they went, almost always integrated remarkably well. And they do. They become middle class businessmen, middle class landowners in Ireland. It's probably about 40 families, not big by any stretch of imagination, uh, but pretty well respected. Um, by about 1746, the Irish Parliament uh, even tried to pass a bill to grant Irish Jews equality before the law. But the old kings of England, George II, grandfather of the man who committed so many uh, <laughs> war crimes in North America years later, you know, your own history. Um, he blocked though, not a big fan of anybody who wasn't the right type of Christian in his mind. It's not just Christian, but the right type of Christian. Uh, but it didn't stop the old Irish parliament. And in 1792, they used to trickle the law, basically boring legalese to grant Irish Jews, Jews living on the island of Ireland, uh, equality before the law. There would no longer be anti-Semitic laws applied to them. Uh, this is remarkable because it would be another 50 plus years before similar laws would be revoked across the water in Britain. There was even a Jewish member of the Irish Parliament towards the end, David Ricardo from a Sephardim family. Um, and beyond that, this community uh, gives generously to charity and helped in the, the struggle for Catholic emancipation. Here's the interesting thing. So while Jews are treated in, uh, unequally in Britain, and for a while anyway in Ireland, unequally, uh, it would have been easier in the 1790s, and certainly throughout the first half of the 19th century, to actually be Jewish in Ireland than Catholic. That's how weird it was back then, because there were still laws limiting the rights of the majority of the population, for reasons that we don't need to go into, but Let's just say it has a lot to do with our, our past, with our neighbor and religious issues, you know. Uh, the point is uh, that by the 1830s and 40s, the Jewish population work with individuals like Daniel O'Connell, a very famous civil rights campaigner, to actually first achieve Catholic emancipation and then where they worked together until the mid 1840s when finally uh, those laws were revoked against Jews. There was actually limited access to education, limited access to certain fields of of educate uh, of pardon me of um, employment uh, and even a, you had to mark yourself off of being, as being Jewish and um, in the Parliament when that was revoked in 1846 you can see there uh, Mr O'Connell who was known as the Emancipator said that Ireland has claims on your ancient race oh, we are the only country that I know of unsullied by any one act of persecution of the Jews and in re return for that kind of um, generosity and for that the reputation Ireland at least at the time had. Um, individuals like Baron the Rock, Lionel Rothschild and others would give very, very, very generously when we were stricken by a famine which killed over a million people, two million or odd fled the country. Uh, and he gave more generously than any of the other, as you can see that as a quote from a newspaper, gave more generously than any of the major landowners or the British government for that matter of the time. And that's something that uh, sadly is not as remembered as it once was, but it's a, it's, a, it's a fact of history. Uh, but we're moving ahead because we need to get to uh, more modern history now. Um, basically today about, I'd say about 60, well no, be less than that, I'd say about 50% of the community um, have been here on and off for about 140, 150 years. Um, and most of those, most of that 50% is coming from Lithuania relatively recently. Um, back the 1880s or so, you start getting the first Litvak uh, arrivals. Um, in the bottom left there, there's a photo, a map of Lithuania, and it shows little names. You can, if you look very carefully, you can see uh, Vilnius and Kovno and scattering of villages where most of the Litvaks came from. Uh, one particular 
I wouldn't even call it a town. It's kind of a village known as Achmian in the northwest of Lithuania is where about 60% of this community came from back in the 1880s. Uh, the rest from different parts of Lithuania. Um, and they're coming here because the, the opportunities that may once have existed in that part of the world disappeared altogether because of another individual, another photo there, top right, uh, Tsar Alexander III, um, for, and, and much like the current Tsar, um, we, don't, we don't need to name him, uh, he was very fond of blaming other people for his problems and others' problems. And he decided to blame Jews and anyone who really had a different opinion than him for the assassination of his father. He'd been actually killed by anarchists, funny enough, in 1881. And he doesn't just blame them, he actually enacts laws to, well, to do all sorts of horrible things. But in regards to Jewish population, um, the May laws are passed and they uh, made sure that Jews in the Russian empire, including that part of the world, uh, for example, did not have the right to own property, didn't have the right to move to other parts of the country, own businesses, put quotas on the placement of, univer of Jews in university. The list goes on and on. Uh, and this was particularly egregious for Litvaks. Litvaks were not uh, the typical shtetl dwellers you, you would be familiar with from, for example, uh, Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> uh, they were living mostly in towns. They were mostly urban dwellers. About, oh God, about 90% of the middle class of Lithuania uh, in the mid 19th century. They were very well educated uh, kind of uh, businessmen. They were not people who are living in, in poverty. And it's and for obvious reasons, that is something that you, you don't want to live in a, suddenly in a country where your ability to make a living, your ability for your children to get education, even just your ability to move to another part of the country is suddenly gone. And so hundreds of thousands uh, of Jews from both Lithuania and all across the pale start arriving, well, both in America, other parts of Europe, uh, and in Britain and in Ireland. Um, and that's where the community arrives. Uh, there's a... Um, two photos at the bottom left there. One is of uh, a photo taken in Cork in the southern part of Ireland in the 1880s. These are more traditional images from the sh the, those who were leaving to the shtetls. Uh, I doubt many of them would have been coming from Lithuania, but it is a valuable photo from the time. And the middle uh, photo there in the bottom is of the, of the street known as uh, Chancery Lane, which is where the very, very first refugees, Jewish refugees arrive in the 1870s and 1880s. So this is the origins of all of this, uh, of our kind of modern community. On we go. Um, but they do not find necessarily the most welcome uh, situation. Uh, for one thing, they're living in, where most people who were poor lived, which was the, the slums, the tenements as we call them, which were pretty grim. Life expectancy in the, in the tenements back then was about five. Wouldn't really want to end up there. Uh, tuberculosis, cholera, all that was rife. And so the community having advantages that uh, a lot of poor people wouldn't have had. They had, um, there was already an existing Jewish community who were giving generously to try and help rehouse them. Uh, there were beneficial societies. There was aid there for them. Uh, They're able to use that help to start moving into a new area of Dublin, uh, which is the area that eventually becomes known as Little Jerusalem. It was a charitable society known as the Dublin Artisans Dwelling Company. It was funded by the rather famous Guinness family, uh, as in the brewing uh, family. Um, and they open up a, a new area of the city known as Portobello to build it from the top up. And suddenly there is a, a Jewish community with a Jewish quarter uh, by the 1890s. Um, and not merely one that had um, its own quarter, but about six of its own uh, synagogues. Uh, the reason being is that they weren't particularly welcome in the existing synagogues. This is something that you'll see not merely in Ireland, but lots of places. Uh, the older community there for 200 odd years, maybe even more, didn't particularly like these new individuals coming in. They, they referred to them as crazy Russians, um, broadly speaking, because they were so different from them. You know, the English Jews, as they were known, were well settled, well integrated. Uh, it would have been a long time since they've been speaking um, Yiddish, a long, long time. Uh, whereas the new arrivals are speaking Russian, they're speaking Lithuanian, Yiddish as well, of course, but very much more orthodox, very much more foreign than they would have been familiar with. And while there's generosity there towards that community, there's also standoffishness. And there's also, these aren't our type of people 
and maybe they'll make us look bad. And that's sad, but it was the way things were back then. Uh, and so there's stories, you can find stories of individuals being given 50 pounds, which was a sizable chunk of change back then, to get on a boat and leave. Um, and being given that at synagogue, at temple, uh, by, by somebody who'd been here, you know, maybe an extra hundred years or whatever. Um, but thankfully that type of animosity doesn't last too long. Um, the man you can see, in, uh, uh, the rabbi you can see there on the top left is Herman Adler, who was the chief rabbi of the British Empire, rather grand title. And he heard about this and said, well, we need to put this to rest. And so he comes to Dublin, talks about kind of representative boat communities and agrees on a new synagogue for boat communities to unite them needs to be built. And so the Dublin Hebrew congregation uh, and it's building its headquarters there on the right uh, is built in 1892. He's there for the, for the opening and basically calls on the two sides to put aside petty grievances and form one community. And while that eventually would be the result, uh, there was a bit too much negativity and a too, bit too much difference for, for that to happen and for the generation who were there at the time. It would probably be not until the 20s and 30s before the community formed much more of a homogenous uh, you know, community, if, that, if, you, if you get me. Uh, but otherwise, things are going well. Um, you have about 3,000 or so just in Dublin. There's many else, elsewhere. But just in Dublin, there would have been about 3,000 living in this small community. Businesses start popping up very quickly. Now, these photos are a mix of different eras. Some are from the 20s and 30s. Some are from the 40s. You can usually tell if you, if you guys are familiar with photo quality and how they degrade over time. And also, to some extent, the, um, the outfits people wore. So, for example, uh, the gold washers, uh, kind of, um, uh, what's the word, uh, butchers on the bottom left there. It's a bit older, probably 1940s. Rubenstein's uh, butcher, top left. That was a bit later, 50s and 60s. Uh, Cohen and Sons, that would have been, again, about 50s and 40s. And the Salon Shalom, uh, rather humorously named, a real place, you can't make this stuff up, uh, it was also about, you know, mid 20th century as well. Uh, the last um, uh, decidedly and obviously Jewish-owned business in Dublin today is the Bretzel Bakery, which is the last kosher bakery in Dublin at the moment. There used to be many more. There used to be about uh, 23 kosher butchers and bakers just in, in Little Jerusalem and in general about 19 convenience stores spread around that area. Um, it was said that when a journalist was walking through the area at the time, he said this was like walking through some quarter of Krakow or Warsaw. None of the kids were speaking English. It was very decidedly separate from the rest of Dublin. Um, but that didn't necessarily come with animosity. We'll talk about the type of anti-Semitism that existed or didn't exist at the time. But for the most part, they're left alone. Um, they form their businesses, they open their businesses. Even those who are less well off become peddlers carrying carts out from the, into the countryside, selling whatever they could sell. Um, there was even those who were known as the tally men who had their peddling carts and they would give out small amounts of credit to working class families to get through the week. Uh, it was called, they were called the tally men because they kept tally on a piece of paper, if you get me, if you understand that word. So things are going well. You know, they're, they're coming from a Lithuanian middle class background, they find themselves in a fairly middle class part of Dublin within one generation. Uh, and for the most part, that comes without any of the type of hassle they got elsewhere. There wasn't the same type of sweated labor or violence that came with, for example, in the East End of London. Anyway, I'm going to show you a bit of a video now. That's just a, a map of uh, the area that we're settling, uh, known as the South Circular Road. But I'm going to show you a video now. This is just something I put together, of clips I was able to find from the Irish National Broadcaster, which is RTE. Uh, but yeah, have a watch. <laughs> Thank uh you. -huh. 
suddenly cutting out <laughs> now let's see so the community is well established it's for the most part um, uh, the first generation would have succeeded to the second by the early 20th century uh, when suddenly um, a revolution begins to explode in Ireland and so one of the, the kind of most prominent uh, examples of Irish Jews and the Jewish community having a role in Irish history would have been that period from roughly about a decade, about 1912 through 1922, 23. Uh, a revolution, it's a long one, goes on. Uh, many stages, which you're not here to hear about, but rather to hear about how the community plays its role. So the second generation did very well out of having come to what was then the United Kingdom, which included Ireland. And though there was certainly a level of discomfort with how, uh, say, hard, hard, uh, hard line, if that's the word, Irish nationalists were initially. They wanted to break off, and there was a feeling, well, they'd done so well in Britain and done so well in Ireland that maybe that's, that should be repaid with a type of loyalty. But at the same time, there was a feeling amongst that generation born here and was Irish that felt, well, no, that's not how things should be. Well, you know, the Jewish people are a dispossessed people having lost their home for 2,000 years, the Irish having uh, been under occupation by the English for, God, what would have been 700 years at that point. There's obviously a feeling of commonality there and the fact that they were Irish, they were born here, they grew up here, they had Irish accents, all, all the things you might, you might imagine. The point is that uh, when that young generation come along, they get very much heavily involved in the revolutionary period. Uh, top right there, you can see um, a very famous building in Dublin in ruins this is uh, known as the General Post Office. It was a headquarter of a, of a rebellion, uh, and obviously that rebellion failed. Uh, amongst those who, who were killed in the rebellion was a man known as Abraham Weeks, uh, who was actually killed on one of the first people to be killed during the revolution. So there is, as the Americans would say, the, the Irish Jewish community had skin in the game. Uh, they were there from the very beginning. Uh, lawyers like Michael Noyek, a painting of which you can see in the bottom right there, uh, helped the rebels to try and escape execution, which many do not escape. Uh, others, like Robert Briscoe, who you can see on the bottom left with uh, another famous Irish figure from the time, uh, would join afterwards. Uh, by 1920, he starts joining uh, a group that has now become very famous uh, around the world as the Irish Republican Army. Believe it or not, at the time, uh, people from about 100,000 people from all across Ireland, and certainly very many high-profile Jewish people, would join that organization, seeing it as a, as a, as a means to achieve liberation from British rule. Um, and in particular, Robert Briscoe would be the dominant figure politically within the community. Uh, he's not only a high ranking member of the IRA, he not only goes on to then found one of the leading political parties in Ireland post-independence in 1927. He's the very first Jewish, Irish Jewish member of the new Irish parliament. He's mayor of Dublin, you know, we could go on and on. Eventually went on to help uh, Menachem Begin. He was actually involved in uh, kind of encouraging him and groups like the Agana and the Ergun in the 1930s and 40s. So there's a long history there to him. He rather humorously called himself the greatest enemy of the British Empire abroad in the world, which sounds rather grand, uh, <laughs> but that's okay. You should have a positive view of yourself sometimes. But I want to show you a little piece, not a little video. This is uh, interviews with his sons. So this is more recent. By 2011, this documentary came out. This is just a clip, but it'll give you a sense of, of the community's role in, in, in Irish independence. So let me just get this started. It is essential to being a Jew that you celebrate the Passover. And it reminds you constantly of your Jewishness. Well, Passover is first and primarily a family occasion. It's a family celebration. A man who isn't loyal to his religion can't be loyal to his country. 
I, I think for Jewish people, it's also a reminder of the importance of, um, of freedom. We have always been loyal to our religion, but it hasn't interfered with our loyalty to our country. There are at most 1,800 Jews in Ireland today, but even at its peak, the community numbered in the region of 5,500. And yet, from the very beginning of the Irish state, Jews have contributed way beyond their weight in numbers. Far from conflicting with Irishness, Jewish identity seems to complement it, infusing it with a deep sense of conviction and obligation. The Jewish community at its height never represented more than half of 1% of the entire population. And yet, if you look around, you can see, even now, the fact that the community has shrunk, they have left behind them a tremendous uh, heritage. In politics alone, the Jews, the small, the small community, contributed a lot. They were interested in the country, they wanted to contribute to the country. The country had been good to them, they wanted to have something back. Well, I think um, Jewish people tend, of their nature, uh, to question things going on around them. Uh, I think uh, there's a great commitment to, to justice and improving society. And I think once you're part and parcel of society, and the Jewish community is very much part of, of this country, uh, you want to make a contribution to improving things, uh, to make life better for other people, uh, not just your own community, but for the wider community and you see yourself as part of the wider community and the only way you can do that on occasions is to be actively politically involved and as a consequence I, I think it's a very good thing uh, that over the years different members of the Jewish community have involved themselves both in local and national politics. We're very proud of the fact that we have the Jews involved in, the, in politics. I mean at the moment we only have one Jewish TD in the door, uh, Alan Shatter, who's a member of Vin again. But at one time we had three Jewish uh, members of parliament at the same time, and they were each representing a different party: Labour, Fine Gael, and Fine Fáil. Uh, and I think this is this is this is this is something that we, as a small community, can be very proud of. We've had quite a contribution to make. We've had uh, three members of the Dáil elected. We've had. Uh, three Lord Mayors, we've had Gerald Goldberg, we've had my late father Robert Briscoe and we've had myself as Lord Mayor in our millennium year. Uh, we've also contributed in other areas of Irish life as, as well in the legal area. But we have uh, also contribut contributed to Ireland's fight for freedom. Coming up to Passover, this is a very important time for Jews and we're also coming up to Easter which is a very important time for Christians. And this was at the time of the Rising. And at that time, believe it or not, the first major synagogue was being actually built in Dublin. As they were building uh, Greenville Hall, this beautiful synagogue, there was a Jewish gentleman named Abraham Wicks, who came, I think, from Liverpool. And he joined in the rebellion, and he was actually killed. We don't know much about him. Uh, unfortunately, because he didn't have any relatives here, uh, but he obviously was very enthusiastic about the Irish uh, fight for freedom. Well, I think that uh, most of the people who came into politics from 1916 were politicians by accident. They were soldiers first who went out to fight for their country. They were idealists. My father, Robert Briscoe, uh, was in the States at the time of the Rising, but he came back in 1917. He was so impressed by what had happened uh, in 1916, the leaders being been executed and that, that he decided that he would do what he could for the uh, independence movement. And in doing that, he became very close to Michael Collins. Uh, my father had a, f was spoke fluent German and Collins uh, was, was later on was trying to get arms from Germany. So my father was used by Michael Collins to do all the negotiating for, for the arms. The, the Civil War broke out. My father took the side of the Republicans, de Valera, uh, 
Now, my father was a, a huge admirer of De Valera. He absolutely worshipped the man. When my father was dying, he actually went into a coma, and neither my late mother or myself, and I was very close to my father, could say anything. I can remember sitting on my father's bed, holding his hand and saying, Dad, Dad, speak to me before you go. De Valera came up, sat down by his bed, held his hand, and said, Bob, Bob, my poor old Bob. And my father opened his eyes. And Dev said, do you know who this is? And he said, yes, the chief. He closed his eyes and went back into his coma. And those are the last words my father uttered. So that would give you an idea of the loyalty that my father had to De Valera. He actually could take him out of a coma. So it could go on longer, but I, I, want, I have a few more things to do. <laughs> now, I'm going to have to zoom through a few of these because I'm aware that you guys will probably have questions and I don't want to uh, overstay my welcome. But there's a few things I want to bring up. I want to bring up the fact that probably the most famous book ever to be written by an Irish author, James Joyce, uh, Ulysses, uh, the main character is Irish Jewish, is Leopold Bloom. Um, he was very, uh, if it's possible, to be very interested in the Jewish community because it was the only thing that was actually exotic about Dublin 100 years ago. There was, we didn't really have immigrants. We do now, but we didn't back then. No one wants to come to Ireland. It was too cold, wet, and there was no jobs. <laughs> so it was quite an unusual thing to have a group of what he would have been felt was, was exotic people on his doorstep in Dublin. And so a lot of the characters, a lot of the surnames that appear in the book, which I would encourage you to try and read, if you get a chance, um, are the kind of resident Litvak or Russian uh, Jewish uh, people. So Bloom, the surname, there's a, there's a Bloomfield Avenue in the Jewish community now, which is where Isaac Herzog, the old um, chief rabbi of Ireland, once upon a time lived. But the actual story seems to mostly come from Joyce being drunk, walking through Dublin, and, and almost being, you know, well, certainly being beaten up, but almost being beaten more than up. Uh, uh, in, in the street, uh, in, sorry, in a park in Dublin called St. Stephen's Green. And he's saved by a Hungarian Jewish man with the surname Bloom. Uh, he then later bases a lot of the actual mannerisms of Leopold Bloom uh, on a man uh, based in Dublin, at the, uh, sorry, a man based in uh, Trieste, Italios Favo uh, at the time. Um, uh, he bases most of his appearance on him. But anyway, uh, the key point here is he was asked about this and he said, well, uh, Bloom had to be Jewish because uh, to be Jewish in Ireland at the time was to be an outsider. Uh, and he said the Jews were not viewed with hostility at the time, but they were seen as outsiders. Now, the key point about this uh, it will be how that changes. So he's writing this in the 19 teens, 1922. Uh, Ireland becomes independent and then things begin to change somewhat. Uh, and that's just because things became, uh, in a rather weird way, more democratic. Uh, so what I meant by that was, Beforehand, Britain decided things in policy. From 1922, it's a democratic parliament and all the good and bad things about, you know, Irish, uh, Irishness uh, became much more present. So certainly things were nicer and less violent in certain ways, but in other ways, the type of bigotry that existed and was propagated sadly by the Catholic church. It, it should be said, it wasn't until 1964 that the Catholic church ceased to preach uh, the, the libel, the blood libel, uh, about the, ex, you know, the, um, the crucifixion uh, of Jesus Christ and it was Jewish people's fault. This is something that inundated so much of Europe at the time and Ireland isn't immune from that. And so the general type of anti-Semitic tendencies that were there uh, start appearing. And so while there hadn't been really any um, anti-Semitic pogroms or anything like that, you start seeing uh, cases over in 1923, two members of the army killed two Jewish men, one man you can see there, Emmanuel Kahn, the bottom left. Um, and this is basically covered up. It's seen as uh, too inappropriate to prosecute these guys. They're allowed to flee the country in 1923. Uh, and it wouldn't be until 2011 before all this all came out in the press uh, that this has been going on. Um, and rather tragically, the individual probably who let them off uh, while he was eventually fired for lots of many, he was actually quite corrupt as well as being anti-Semitic, which is probably not surprising. Personality disorders display themselves in lots of different ways. Um, but he went, on, he went on to take that firing pretty badly. And in the bottom right there, you can see what he ended up doing with his free time. 
forming the Irish fascist movement, because why else, why, what else would he be doing in his time, I suppose? And his name was Owen O'Duffy, and that, they were known as the blue shirts. It's so not the black shirts, not the brown shirts, the blue shirts. So we don't escape having our own fascist movement. It's just that they were so useless that they didn't prove out to be that dangerous in the end. But that was, you know, that's kind of beside the point. Um, if there's any type of um, story to be had here, if there's a narrative end when it came to him and, and his beliefs, it was that he eventually went over to Spain in the 1930s and ended up facing down a lot of Irish communists because while he was a fascist, his political opponents were communists and amongst them, uh, the communists in Spain was a group of Irish Jewish communists, as small as they were. They were known as the Connolly Column. And so on the left there uh, of the photo of that fascist Owen O'Duffy, O'Duffy was who he met in the fields of Spain. Uh, what I'm going to do now is you're going to have to zoom ahead a bit because um, we are getting awfully close to the time when I meant to take questions. So I'll briefly just say this. Ireland say, stays uh, neutral in the Second World War. It, the, the belief was, at least initially, that Britain is the real enemy. So we're talking 1939. We don't escape bombings. Germany does bomb Dublin. In fact, part of the Jewish community was bombed at the time. Um, the real issue with Ireland in World War II is not, as some would say, that, that we stayed neutral. Lots of other states did. It was that we did not accept uh, refugees. The sad fact is maybe 100 refugees arrived here legally. About 2,000 arrived illegally. You want to call it illegal um and despite the fact that um the state knew from about 1941 that the holocaust uh was underway um it did not change its policies uh it wasn't the only one i'm not going to pretend that ireland was uniquely uh lacking in empathy um lots of people were lots of states were america was for god's sake um but the point was that uh, we're not talking about america we're not talking about other countries we're talking about ireland and ireland's decision to turn its back when the facts were pretty evident uh, is even more extreme when you uh, hear the story of poor Eshi Steinberg, who uh, was born in Dublin, grew up here, married, as you can see in her wedding photo there, um, in 1937 in Dublin, um, and unfortunately married a, well, not unfortunately married a Belgian man, but unfortunately moved to Belgium at the wrong time and, um, and had to flee twice from the German invasion, first in 1940 and then well, sorry, first in 1939, then in 1940. Um, and sadly was eventually along with her son and her husband killed in, in, in Auschwitz. Um, now, while there are memorials to Eshi today, and there has been an apology by the Irish state for its lack of interest in, in helping people, uh, it is something that is very still very poorly understood. Uh, basically, that that type of bigotry that was underneath uh, the surface was one of the main reasons why figures like Eshi and others, presumably, that we don't know about, uh, met a tragic end. Uh, it's also one of the reasons why individuals like the Daughters of Zion, the Hadassah, and many other uh, Zionist groups in, in Ireland uh, kind of were very much organizing in the 1940s and 50s, and many of the community that uh, had settled here would leave. Um, now, a final thing I'm going to show you is what I think is probably the peak of the community's influence. And I'll leave you with this thought, which is that um, the chief rabbi, the first chief rabbi of Ireland in 1920s was a man called Yitzhak or Isaac Herzog. He would go on in 1937 to go to British occupied, what was then known as the, uh, the Mandate of Palestine. He'd become the first Ashkenazi chief rabbi uh, of Israel, I think from 1948. Um, and his son would become the sixth president of Israel. He was born in, in, in Ireland, grew up here, had an Irish accent to the end of his life. And I'd like to leave you with, uh, with a very short interview from him. This is from the 1980s. It's a long time ago for me anyway. <laughs> um, so listen to see what he has to say, not only about Ireland, but also about Israel. And we'll leave it at that. Northern Ireland's problems are not the only thing which appear at times to be insolvable. In Jerusalem, we went to see a man with more than a passing interest in Ireland. Kyle Herzog is the president of Israel. He fought in the British Army in the Second World War and grew up in Dublin. He was born in Belfast. I was born in a place called, and this is according to my birth certificate, called Two Norman Villas, Cliftonville Road, off the Antrim Road, quite posh. 
Uh, I don't know what it is now. I don't know what it was then, but uh, I did go to look for it when I was stationed in the British Army in Northern Ireland in the World War. And uh, very naturally, I follow the uh, uh, events in Ireland today with a very considerable amount of, of uh, anguish. I for uh, Israeli radio, uh, in which I compared the history of the Jewish people and the history of the Irish people, because there are a tremendous number of similarities between us. Uh, first of all, uh, this uh, very vivid uh, sense of humor, which emerges from a period of a long period of oppression, that you'll find both with the Irish and with the Jews, an ability to laugh at yourself, uh, which is also very healthy. And that also exists. Let me ask you this. You were the governor of the West Bank and you had a marvelous record there. And also you were brought up on the borders of the Civil War in, in the south of Ireland. And what I wanted to ask you was, did that experience, the Irish experience, the conflict in Ireland, did that help you at all in your dealings with the Arab-Israeli problem? I would say yes. <clears throat> My parents always said that uh, they came here at the time the British mandate and went through all the problems that we had uh, with the British uh, colonial authorities at the time and the struggle here. And then we had even struggles within our own community, all of which was uh, evoked memories of what went on in Ireland. I uh, certainly uh, would say that uh, we learned a lot. And we learned also what not to do, I would say, uh, because um, we learned the very great importance of sticking together within the community, although at times it wasn't so. And uh, also, it became quite clear to us that somewhere or other, we must reach a compromise with uh, the Arabs. And in fact, the strength of Israel's case all along has been the fact that we were always in favor of compromise right through, and they were never in favor of compromise. They always wanted 100%. And the net result was that we who favored compromise invariably succeeded, as opposed to them who did not favor compromise. Herzog is a former labor politician. And you sense that his plea in favor of compromise is directed as much at the Jews as at the Arabs. But if talk. Would a Jewish compromise ever include the handing back of the occupied West Bank? In the meantime, the situation continues. And for these young Jews celebrating their bar mitzvahs by the Western Wall in Jerusalem, the only certainty when they leave school is direct entry into the Israeli army. Latvia and Lithuania, Limerick, Belfast, Jerusalem, coming to Israel, whether to live or merely to visit, in a way, completes the long journey begun over a century ago by those early waves of Jewish refugees. The situations in Israel and Ireland are complex, difficult, and different. Why? But it's hard not to feel that that urgent need for compromise applies to both. Perhaps this is a better place than most to pray for. Hey, Alex, we're, it's better to probably close up the presentation so we can get to the questions. Yeah, no, that was it. That was the presentation done anyway. So perfect timing. Uh, well, not really, but uh, <laughs> I always go a bit long. Okay, that's just the problem of being a historian. Um, Okie doke. Yeah. So if you want to throw any questions at me, I'll try and answer them. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Danny, uh, you have the question. So thank you so much, Alexander. And um, if you have additional questions, you can send them uh, directly to Danny or to me, and we'll try to get through as many as we can. Thank you so much. Oh, one last thing, one last thing to say. I've, I said this before in previous presentations. I have a collection of documentaries about the community. So if anyone would like uh, me to send that on to them, I can do that for free. Just contact Danny or whoever, uh, and I'll send that on to it for free. Yeah, actually, uh, you already have a lot of requests, uh, Alexander, for your email, which we put into the chat. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. It's Dublin Tales, right? Yep. At, uh, that's the one. At gmail.com. So that's in the chat there. And, um, and you all should be encouraged to, to follow up with Alexander directly and, and continue learning. I know we, we always open the door with these presentations, but there's so much more 
um, to learn about. So I'll ask Alexander to try and go with the short answers as possible so we can get through a lot of these questions. Um, first and foremost, way back when, 30 minutes ago in the presentation, um, someone was wondering what was the special attire that the Jews um, had to wear that was eventually ended? Yeah, no, by the end, it was merely um, an armband or some type of decoration um, showing Monaghan David. So basically, the Star of David in some fashion. But earlier on, it would have been a kind of series, you know, it would have been much more kind of intense, kind of black clothing, much more familiar. Again, if you've ever been to um, any of the Orthodox communities in New York or whatever, you know, it, you would be familiar with what they were required to wear. Got it. And I, I also want to share with you that there's many on this call that either have ancestors that are from Ireland uh, or they themselves are, are from Ireland as well. So cool. really, really cool to uh, to have you connect via email with um, with people who are who are listening in today. Um, I think I know the answer to this one because we spoke about it before with music. Given the love of the Irish for great folk songs, do you happen to know of any Irish Jewish folk songs? Um, that's a good point. Um, not off the top of my head, but I have a book. Uh, where I, so the person who's asked that question, if you want to contact me, I can send you on uh, some information, but there's no super famous Kletzmer band. Oh, wait, there is. There is one rather famous Kletzmer, Kletzmer band from Dublin. I, I will pass on that information to that person if they contact me. Cool, great. Uh, Susan was wondering uh, if she understood correctly, you can no longer keep kosher in Ireland? No, you can't. Uh, there's a two places in Dublin. Well, you can do it in Dublin. It's much more difficult outside of Dublin. Uh, there's two places in Dublin that you can buy um, kosher bread, kosher meat, uh, but outside of those two areas, which are near the Orthodox synagogue, it is difficult, yes. Got it. And I, get, I don't know if you could say this in kilometers or miles, but uh, someone is wondering how large was the actual area of Little Jerusalem? Maybe oh, tell us if you were walking, you know, like you do. If you were walking and, you, and you're a healthy walker, uh, from, the or from the very first kind of major synagogue in 1892, through to the one that was built in the 1920s on the same road, I'd say mm, half an hour walk, you know, a normal half an hour walk through. So I'd say it would have been maybe two, two miles long, but a mile wide. Um, and it was, that was the area where 90% of the community were, were Jewish. Uh, there were people obviously living outside those, that community that was Jewish. And today there's no one fixed area that's Jewish anymore. Got it. Um, Carol was wondering if there's any advice you might have on how uh, she or anyone could do genealogy of their family if they happen to know that their great grandmother, for example, uh, was from Ireland. Do, do you know yes. of any organizations that, that work with that? I do. There's a guy called Stuart Rosenblatt. Uh, he has basically put together every single person who was ever on this island that we know of that was Jewish. And he put together in hard copy the complete genealogy of those people. So you can either contact him online. Uh, he still does stuff to that. You can also contact the museum. They have a hard copy of his work uh, and they'll probably help you if you walk into off the street. I've done that when I've been volunteering there. But at the very least, contact Stuart Rosenblatt. He'd be the man to talk to. Great. Um, and Linda was wondering, at one point you were talking about uh, the TDs. Maybe that's a member of Irish Parliament? Or, yes, or it's, an, it's an Irish. So in, our, we, in Ireland, there's, uh, in theory anyway, it's a bilingual state. So there's both English and Irish which is the older language. And TD means Chuck the Dala in Irish, which means basically the same thing as member of parliament. Got it. Um, and, and how can uh, people get access? Well, you mentioned before that you can send the Shalom Ireland movie and any documentaries that are yep. out there as well. So just uh, write to uh, Dublin Tales at Jewish, uh, excuse me, at gmail.com. Um, and uh, Alexander can, can back, get back to you there. Um, and the other questions that were coming in, you know, you spoke about it earlier, but I guess that today, right, 2022, have yeah. you seen an increase in blatant anti-Semitism, uh, no. anti-Zionism? Do you want no. to just well, speak about that? It's <laughs> That's a tough one, I know. Okay. So anti-Semitism, no. Um, there hasn't really been, um, apart from what happened back in the 1930s and 40s, um, I'd say there hasn't, not really, I mean, there was a good story I heard once. The, the wife of Ben Briscoe, um, uh, who volunteers in the museum, uh, told me this story years ago. She said that when she was a young girl in the 50s, um, she uh, went, you know, it was summer break and she came back. And, the nun and back then, the nuns taught the girls and the priests taught the boys. 
Um, and she basically had read a book about the Holocaust and she hadn't heard about it because in Ireland was fairly isolated at the time in the early 1950s. And she was, and the, the, the nun said, oh, what did you read during the summer? And she said she'd read about the Holocaust. And the nun said to her, well, you shouldn't feel sad about that. It's just Jews. Now, if your nun's telling you that in school, um, you, you, as you imagine a figure of authority, at that time, the nuns and the priests were very, very much figures of authority. That type of, that was hardly going to encourage an open-minded view of, of the population. Now, that's no longer the case and hasn't been the long, that case for a long, long time. Uh, there was never, you know, anti-Semitic laws passed in Ireland. There were certainly anti-Semitic um, uh, policies in World War II. But in, in regards, no, I mean, we don't really have a history of it. Now, as, as to anti-Zionism, so I'd say to understand that you have to go back into the 70s. In the 1970s, um, the, the war in Northern Ireland was on, was known as the Troubles. Uh, broadly speaking, between people who were Protestant and people who were Catholic, I'm not gonna go hugely into it. I will merely say this, that while one side, the IRA, the Catholic side, uh, gained weapons and training from the Palestinian, the PLO, the other side, the Protestant side, gained weapons from Israel and from South Africa. And so what began as a, a civil war in Northern Ireland, uh, it, it kind of generated out and other movements and other organizations and states were drawn in. And so uh, what began then has kind of, if you fast forward to the present day, people who tend to be inheritors of the IRA, so groups like Sinn Féin, tend to be not particularly fond of Israel. And, and you know you know what I mean by that. And people who uh, would have been inheritors of uh, the other side uh, would in similar be devout supporters of Israel in the same way. So it's become a, a, a kind of a symbolic thing. So for example, if you have, if you go up to Belfast and you go into the areas that are very uh, contentious, the Catholic side will have flags of Palestine, the Catholic, sorry, the Protestant side will have the Palestinian flag. And if people can understand, if I, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna go in too much more into it other than to say that I would wonder how deep that, you know, that understanding of the, of the conflict in Israel-Palestine is. I'd say it's at this point, it's become more about the tribalism that exists over here and less about any real knowledge, but that's just my opinion, so. Don't take my word for it, read around.